we have an indigenous way of preserving heritage, which is about preserving knowledge, not objects and monuments. The local people had space in my research. I'm doing archaeology, but also I know and I recognize their knowledge and they're part of it. It made me understand this dim awareness of an ancient past. When you look at how societies are living today, I believe archaeology can give people answers. A visit to Hargeisa, the capital city of the semi-autonomous region of Somalia, will reveal that the self-declared state of Somaliland is a vibrant center for culture and commerce. At the heart of the city, the money market is a sight to marvel at. Volume after volume of local and foreign currencies are openly exchanged like groceries. The animal market exports about 10,000 herds of domestic animals to many regions of the world every day. Hargeisa is Sada Mire's home away from home. Sada lives and works in the Netherlands. A professor of archaeology at the University of Leiden, during the holidays, she returns to Somaliland to extend the research works she started many years ago. But how exactly did she get into archaeology? While in high school in Sweden, she began to be confronted with issues of personal identity and understanding her historical roots and heritage. Where are you from? London. London? Oh, that's nice. Do you miss it? No, no, no. When I first thought of archaeology was when I was in secondary school in Sweden. We were presented with our history book. It had only one page on Africa. And if you look at the rest of the book, it's so detailed about Asia, Europe, America. As an African student, I just thought, this, is, this, this can't be real. And I thought, OK, so where can I find uh, history books on Africa? I asked the teacher. And he said, I don't know. And I said, but you did history in university to be able to teach us. And he said, yes, but even in university, we don't study African history. It was during this period of her teenage years that she made the decision to study archaeology so as to understand her heritage. Just an hour's drive north of Hargeisa, Oberhalle is one of the first heritage sites where Sada began her archaeological work. This remarkable site hosts the ruins of an ancient city and an Islamic shrine that sheds light on the ancient history of the region. This open ground is the ancient city. So you are inside the ancient city of Oberhadle, probably the first city of the Odal Kingdom, uh, 16th century. I remember hearing when I was a child from my grandmother and my mother the word Oberhadle. And I started asking questions and then I came to this shrine and as I was walking around, I thought, well, actually, this is more than Islamic. There is clearly pre-Islamic evidence here. And then as I just kept walking and walking, I kept you know, stumbling over the vastness of that burials. And then I saw the city wall and it really just came about in that random organic way. As you can see, I am now standing in the middle of the wall here. 
goes through the mountain and goes down around the river and over the site. So it shows the continuous habitation and settlement of many, many different um, cultures in different periods of time, continuously using this site as a burial site, as a settlement site, as a city, also as an important landscape for practices. This Islamic shrine is used as a pilgrimage site because it is the tomb of the first Islamic religious leader in the region. It's a place where I find um, quite, it's quite unique. It's a legend in many parts of Africa. Where you have a, a wicked pre Islamic or pro Christian leader, often indigenous, and uh, new religion comes, takes over, brings civilization, brings writing. And I think archaeology has a role to play because it shows so much complexity and relationship. <laughs> Oberhadl is one of those sites that really shows that um, in, a, in a very explicit way. The significance of this place is that it mirrors centuries, if not millennia, of development of an African community, the remnants of iron smelting. So these people were actually making iron uh, objects and tools and it's not surprising because it's an ancient city. The iron smelting production of indigenous material culture like the pottery indicates vast industries. So it shows that this landmass of Africa, this area that we know as the Horn of Africa, has in fact uh, always been a cultural crossroads. The Horn of Africa is believed to be the location of the fabled Land of Punt, as was recorded in ancient Egyptian texts. Also known as the Land of the Gods or the Land of Plenty, Punt had deep trade ties with Egypt dating back 2,000 years or earlier and was rich in resources such as gold, ebony, ivory, spices and incense trees, treasures cherished by the Egyptian pharaohs. Somaliland covers a total surface area of about 170,000 square kilometers with a population of around 4 million people. Its capital city Hargeisa has approximately 1.4 million inhabitants of whom about 70% are below the age of 30 years. When the civil war broke out in Somalia in 1991, 15-year-old Sada and her family had to flee the country for Sweden as refugees. The country, Somalia, went through a lot of changes very qu quickly after independence. By the time the civil war happened, my father was already dead and uh, some of my family members had left the country. Uh, we ended up as refugees, moving around for a year, and then learning that um, our sister actually ended up in a place called Sweden, and then um, mobilizing to go there. We managed to get to Sweden, and then we started a life there. Sada and her archaeological team are on the road again. This time, they will be traveling to Daimole, about 200 kilometers northeast of Hargeisa. On this trip, she is accompanied by three scholars of astroarchaeology. They are taking this trip 
to try and discover how archaeology can reveal the level of knowledge about the galaxy and universe in the ancient cultures of the region. Sada arrives at a small oasis village near Daimole. In true humility, she sits down on the ground with the ladies of the village and listens to their stories. Sada has recognized the role local people play as the custodians of ancient knowledge and she listens as they transmit this knowledge orally, as they have done for generations. For me, understanding then that the local people had space in my research, it was a two-way street. I, I'm doing archaeology, but also I know and I recognize their knowledge and they're part of it. But talking to them uh, and understanding that their immediate reaction to what is your heritage, it made me understand a part of this landscape, of this dim awareness of an ancient past. We have to know enough about the societies that we study to understand uh, how to make relevant our research for the local communities. The Daimole Heritage Site is about eight kilometers away, and the team accompanying Sada, comprised of Ahmed, Abshir, and Aden, have to walk all the way. The astroarchaeology team are experts in folklore based on ancient astrology of the region. After about an hour of trekking, Sada and the team arrive at the mysterious cave of Daimole, believed to be about 3,000 to 5,000 years old. Now we've traveled from Tarmac, I don't know, for two hours. And it wasn't easy. I've been here so many times, but I always get lost because the farms change and they all make new ways. The beauty about it is once you get here, it's just so rewarding. You get reinvigorated. You want to walk and you want to see. And like now we are sitting here under this natural shade. It's a lovely breeze. You could fall asleep here. So it's, it's a lovely environment. We are yeah, at the site now with Odeke uh, Sheke, which is a research group that I work with, a group of researchers doing astronomy, uh, basically looking at traditional calendars. And they have been working on understanding the traditional calendar. And what we see immediately as we come in is the moon in different phases. Crescent, you have a full moon, you have a full moon here, but you also have what we think is the four seasons, a square with a diagonal cross. We're trying to um, come from both archaeological but also from the perspective of folklore to understand how uh, we can conceptualize this her inherited um, uh, depictions of what we think is a calendar along with the oral knowledge of the traditional Somali calendar. And this, this calendar is not much in use except by a few nomads. And this site is very unique because it's the only site that we know that depicts, in fact, what looks like a calendar. So there is a relationship between these symbols and what we think is the calendar. Because over there, you, you, have, the cal you have the moon, you have the crescent, you have the 28, um, uh, if you like, holes for the day of the month. And you have the cross, the, of the diagonal, um, cross with the uh, square which shows the four seasons but then again when you move in here new symbols are present and adjacent with the with the full moon Hundred eight, eight, hundred eighty. Okay. 
بدي يحمل هذه كل شيء وحين فارغ قدم لها كم دوا دوا خلا ما دار كم يعني ورقوا على عيد اللي تشوفوا حقا تشوفوا برجع ومن وحوق بوا ورقا بتعرف صورة صورة إيش صورة اللي يقعد بلو حس ولي كلام مولا صور كلام يرم المضي ورقا واحد سلا ده هاي عرق البيت يمك أو ورقا وكلا أو ورقا عرق وكلا أو ورقا عرق وكلا وحس كل ما ورقا عرق يوم ينا سكان لازم بس له هاي ولكن <تصفيق> 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 What you see there are depictions of camels, but also we have a few giraffes, and the giraffes show us the fact that actually at some point this landscape was quite fertile. In the 15th century, Zheng He an explorer from China's Ming Dynasty commanded seven naval expeditions through the Indian Ocean. During his fourth and fifth voyages, Zheng He's fleet visited towns along the east coast of Africa, of what are now Kenya and Somalia. Inspired by the visit, envoys of the region would pay homage to the Chinese emperor presenting treasures including an African giraffe which caused a huge sensation in China. Now we don't have any giraffes. We didn't see a giraffe on our way here and you can't find any giraffes in the whole region now because of the droughts, because of the civil war. We understand a little bit about environment by the depiction of animals, wild animals. So it's a holistic site in that sense. In Northeast Africa, you don't have many potential calendar. This is the only one that I am at least aware of. Back from Daimole, Sada and the Oregesheke team must share what they have uncovered with an eager audience of young university students in Hargeisa. <laughs> When you look at how societies are living today, I believe archaeology can give people answers. By understanding where I come from, where my people come from, I can also understand where I am from and what has happened to me and why I'm here, where I am, why I am who I am. And it helps me formulate the future aware, not just for myself, but with the community by understanding where we come from. My past to the east of Hargeisa, the region of Las Gel hosts some of the most amazing ancient works of African art ever to be discovered. In the Somali language, Las Gel simply means a drinking place for camels. This place never lacks cool drinking water, even in the driest of seasons. Just a quick dig on the riverbed and one will find cool, refreshing water for both man and animals. This is Sheikh Musa's home. He is employed by the national government to safeguard this site and levy fees on visitors who want to explore it. The Las Gel site has a series of about 18 caves, 
with each having unique stories depicted in form of rock art. On this trip, Sada is accompanied by 19-year-old Shakib, a student of history and culture at the University of Hargeisa. Apart from um, education, um, basically I like to help my baby. Uh, we want to uh, spread awareness. Uh, we hold uh, academic discussions so as to discuss uh, the challenges and opportunities in our Africa generally and specifically in uh, Somaliland. Sada has brought Shakib along to explain to him what the site is all about. Laskel is at, at least 5,000 year old rock art site. It's part of a tradition of um, cultural style across Northeast Africa, from the Libyan desert all the way to the east, to the eastmost of the Horn of Africa. And so this style is associated with the earliest food producing cultures of Africa. So farmers and uh, pastoralists. And what we are seeing here is vast amounts of paintings in polychrome, various colors, of cows with big horns and prominent udders. And those are very significant in terms of the tradition of Northeast Africa as general. So here you have, for example, the, the legs, what looks like a pair of legs, hands, and kind of a head. But it's not a real head. Those are not real hands. That's not real legs. And definitely they were not wearing trousers 5,000 years ago. Definitely not in this climate. <laughs> What is amazing about this particular place is that although it's part of a mountain chain going west and east, that east-west belt, going through Ethiopia, the distinctive style of Lascale uh, type is only in this part of, of the Somali region. But this particular uh, rock in Lascale is quite unique because it has uh, such a rich preservation. Las Gelf, it's, it's a rock art site, it's, a, it's an amazing site. When you look at the symbolism, the expression in the art of big cows with big udders and, and the notion of fertility, you understand that it's been 5,000 years, but we have the same needs. We still need fertility, we still need livestock, we still need this earth to be fertile. But also it shows expressive uh, art and painting, symbolism, and that's under threat if you look at it, because that kind of tradition doesn't exist here anymore. Obviously there are people who paint, who are artists, but that sense of artistic heritage is not something that people have appropriated 
as a heritage. They do not understand the value. And that lack of understanding puts these sites under threat because it's easily ignored, it's easily destroyed, and it will not have stakeholders who would really protect the site. From Las Gel, Sada heads straight to the printers to collect a map outlining all the heritage sites in Somaliland. This is the culmination of all the work she has been undertaking for the last 15 years. About 103 sites are captured in this map, and Sada Mire and her team have been to each site even those located in extremely remote areas. When I went to UNESCO and said, you have done nothing for Somali heritage, they said, but we don't know anything about Somali heritage. We haven't got any list of inventory for, for, for Somalia. So my first goal was to create an inventory list so that I never had to explain to anybody anywhere whether we had heritage or not in terms of archaeology. So uh, my team and I um, produced those maps so everybody can access so that no one can say I didn't know. The University of Hargeisa is the academic center of the country and houses the historic and heritage scholarship. Sada Mire does many lectures here. Shakib and Nadira study here and are among Sada's menti scholars that she hopes will take up the mantle of the scholarship. And <laughs> And Dr. Sada Mire and Ablegri and the Mook Heritage under threat, I did say the Betana, Makan Ablegri, Kedi Asher the Sassi no Sudan. On this youth day held at a local hotel, Sada will be giving a talk to Somali youth groups on the importance of archaeology in safeguarding their heritage. Regardless of what educational background they have, they can play a role in heritage and um, archaeology. I wanted them to understand that the sites are not just monuments and artifacts, this is uh, sources of knowledge and that they can use it in every career. Through lessons learned from archaeology, Sada is hoping that the next generation of Somaliland will be able to cherish their past heritage and make informed decisions that will shape their future generation. I want my, my students to take over, to be the ones to do this. And I want the history books to change, to represent peoples in an accurate, fair way. If we know each other better, we will treat each other better.